Let's open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation 12 is one of those amazing chapters in the Bible when God steps back and gives us kind of the way he looks at things, a, a kind of a divine perspective on history. And the 12th chapter, if you understand the, the rest of the Bible, it just makes perfect sense. It's uh, The Woman, the Child, and the Dragon. Kind of sounds like a C.S. Lewis book title, right? Uh, the Woman, the Child, and the Dragon. Uh, but this 12th chapter gives us a perspective and answers for us a lot of things that uh, we don't otherwise fully understand how they got the way they are, such as where the demons came from and what Satan's really focusing on in his nefarious um, calling in his life uh, to oppose God. And all that's kind of here in this 12th chapter. In just a minute, we'll read that. But Satan the dragon, as the 12th chapter describes him, has a fixation on destroying the people of the name. The people uh, of the name, Hashem, as they call it, those who bear the name of God. Now, they don't act like it. A lot of them don't believe it. Most of them are in unbelief. But whether they like it or not, they are the chosen people of promise, the Jewish people. But God has written history and he's put it on paper that he is going to save a remnant of Israel at their final and most desperate hour. That's a good read. You ought to read it sometime if you haven't lately. Zechariah 12, 13, and 14. Remember, that's the book just for Malachi, and that's the one just for Matthew. And it's good. I encourage most people to try and spend the uh, few minutes it takes a day to read the whole Bible once a year, because in heaven someday you're going to meet those people. Can you imagine going down the buffet there and, and being between two people, and one of them, you know, you say, hey, hi, who are you? He says, Haggai. You go, Haggai, where are you from? He goes, Israel. Well, what would you do? He says, I wrote part of your Bible. <laughs> and you go, oh, I didn't read all that. You know, it, you know can you imagine that? So at least know their names and uh, at least know the books. But, but Zechariah 12 through 14 talks about the end of the end of days. And the way it ends is, you've heard of Armageddon. Well, Armageddon is north of Jerusalem. And Jesus, just on the way by, destroys all the armies of the world. But he's headed to Jerusalem. He just kind of doesn't even touch down in Armageddon. He just, from the word of his mouth, destroys them all. But he's going to Jerusalem. You know what prompts the second coming? Do you know how we know when he's coming? The day or the hour knows no one but God. But do you know what, in the, when you read, what prompts it? Finally, all of the forces of the world harnessed by Satan have finally rounded up all the Jews in one place. They finally have them all in one place and they're closing in like this and they have mowed down two-thirds of them. And they're just killing them. Just and they get down and there's just that one piece left and they all know that nothing's going to help them. And all of a sudden, they all together go, oh, we have one other option. And right then, the Lord comes through the cloud. You ought to read Zechariah. It's wonderful what he does. But he comes in their most desperate and final hour and saves them, and they believe on him. Well, Satan can read. And so he knows the written down parts of the plan. And for the past 2,600 years since God had that plan written down in the Scriptures and some other parts were revealed, Satan has intensified his plan to thwart God. First, he wanted to cut off the Jews because he figured out that the Messiah was going to be born from the Jewish people. And because God kept narrowing it down where he was coming, he was just trying to wipe out the line so Christ wouldn't make it. That was Herod's, you know, kill all the, the children. All, I mean, he did, Herod didn't think of that. It, it was totally Satan trying to ruin this plan. But once the cat was out of the bag, you know, Christ was born. It was too late in the cross. But Satan is still trying to ruin the plan because he's already read the ending and he knows that there are Jews in Jerusalem at the end that culminates the end of the world. That's what triggers the, the hatred and the world war, whatever it will be by then, when everybody comes and, and it's converging on Jerusalem. And he figures if he can get rid of the Jews, we won't have the end. He won. See, it's simple when you look at it from his perspective. Satan wants to thwart God's plan. 
Have you ever wondered what Satan's priorities are? His obsession that works him like a workaholic day and night. Well, if you really look at the Bible, the most powerful, dangerous, and intelligent being in the universe next to God, by the name of Satan, has quite a focused attack plan. If you think back, what has Satan been doing? If you just do a thumbnail sketch of biblical history, in Eden's outer garden, Satan got the first son born on earth by the name of Cain to kill his brother Seth, who was the only descendant of Adam and Eve that was a true worshiper of God. Adam and Eve only had two children at that moment, and the one who wasn't a worshiper of God killed the one who was. And do you think Cain thought that up by himself? The book of 1 John only mentions one person by name other than the Lord, and 1 John talks about Cain, because Cain is such a tool in the hand of the devil. Well, in Noah's day, a few generations later, Satan got a group of demons to interfere with humanity, corrupt the human race, so that only humans, there were only eight humans who were left who loved and served the Lord. I mean, he got close then. He got it down to only eight that were a remnant through which God could work. Well, by the time we get three chapters later to Genesis 11, when finally God let his plan be seen by his choice of Abraham to be the father of his chosen people of destiny, the Jew, the Jews, Satan went into high gear. I mean, now he didn't have to try and destroy the whole world. He could focus on one little segment. And so God revealed the people through Abraham that he had chosen to be the human vehicle through which his word, the Bible, his son, our Savior Jesus Christ, his church built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets, all of which are Jewish, by the way, uh, that even his church and finally his end of days would unfold through those people, the chosen people of destiny, the Jews. So Satan had a target. And he's had a target ever since Genesis 11. And anti-Semitism is as old as Genesis 11, when God called Abraham over 4,000 years ago. Hatred of Jews is the heart of Satan. And all who share that hatred are doing Satan's plan. Now, the problem with that is that a strong dislike for Jews and Jewish people and Israel has crept into mainline Protestantism. And that's amazing that they would disagree. It's okay to disagree. The Jews are a little proud, a little arrogant. They throw their weight around. You know, a lot of them are wealthy and influential, but that doesn't matter. They're sinners. So are we. They're unsaved sinners, most of them. But they are God's chosen people of destiny. The only group that God says the church is grafted into Israel. Never forget that, God says. Read Romans 9, 10, 11. He says, never forget that the stump and the root and the trunk is Israel. And the church is just grafted onto that. He said, don't get proud about who you are. He says, you're just grafted in. If you know anything about raising plants... The bottom part is quite important for the life of the rest. And so that's God's perspective, and we never should forget that.